Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Willkommen im Filmmuseum, im Deutsches Filmmuseum und Film Institute. Um, my name is Ellen Harrington. I'm going to be speaking in English tonight um, because we have a very international audience and an international guest who we're so honored to welcome here in the Film Museum. Um, I know you all know why you're here, um, but uh, just briefly to put some context to the importance of our guest tonight. She's been nominated for Oscars twice. She's been nominated twice for the BAFTA, she, five times for the Golden Globes and has won and has appeared in some of the most important films um, yet made in cinema, um, such as Cries and Whispers, Autumn Sonata, which we just screened tonight, Scenes from a Marriage, uh, and so many other um, partnerships that she had with Ingmar Bergman. It is his centennial. He's turning 100, or he would be turning 100 this summer. And we have a wonderful retrospective that we're screening of his films. And she has honored us with her presence and introduced uh, Autumn Sonata earlier tonight. And we'll be talking about many of her other collaborations with Bergman and other artists uh, throughout her incredible career. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Liv Ullman. Welcome. I understand with the Bergman Centennial, you had many invitations throughout the world and had many places to go. And we're really honored that Frankfurt is uh, one of the places you selected to be present. And um, I also know that there's something that you'd like to say to the audience before we begin our conversation. So I invite you now. Yes, I, I, I have written down some words because uh, I know I'm not to be honored, but I am honored because I'm here because of Ingmar. And I would like to just tell you my personal memory of Ingmar and me, and uh, I've written it down. I want to thank you, first of all, for inviting me here. And you were very early out. And, and that was good, because when I decided I'm not going to do this anymore, <laughs> already I knew I was coming here. And I'm so happy. And I've, I've seen this whole museum and institute tonight uh, while you watched the movie, those of you who did. And it is incredible. And I'm so inspired. But this is about Ingmar. And me. Ingmar believed that through movies he could communicate directly with other people, not through their minds, but right to and from their souls. Can you hear me? By cinema, Ingmar said, we can reach new and previously unknown worlds. We can reach realities beyond the reality. For a long time, I believe that he must have felt like the knight in the seventh seal. Who will ever forget Max von Sydow playing chess with death? The Reaper, the knight says, my heart is empty. My indifference for my fellow man isolates me from them. Please give me a little more time, death, and allow me to find redemption through one meaningful deed. Please let me do an act of selflessness that will give my life purpose. Before Ingmar turned 50 years, he made up his mind that he wanted to be an islander, to live on an island. And we together built a house on Fora and we moved in together. 
Thus, for a long time, I got to know the writer better than the filmmaker. And both of us shared a love for our grandmothers, the one who told us stories and believed everything about us. My grandmother told me the story of the ballet dancer, the really wonderful ballet dancer, the one that makes that tremendous jump up in the air and stays in the air two or three seconds than it is possible to do. That is art, my grandmother said. Ingmar's, he told me of his grandmother, who taught him to seek the high mountains, the vast clouds, the silent forests, the rippled spring. Ingmar told me about the unknown destination of his life. I was there once, he said, when I was very young, a boy. Since then, I am trying to find my way back. Ingmar was always looking for, talked about, wrote in his film scripts this kind of knowledge he called wisdom beyond knowledge. And like so many others, we were captivated by his work and learned of his urge to come close to another human being and his deep understanding of the ones who failed. The possibility of love, as well as the unfulfilled love, it's like he's holding a a mirror upon himself, and thus he describes you and me. There, on Fora, the island, he sat at his desk, writing, planning, looking forward to the next film, the next meeting with his beloved crew and actors. Music always flowing, from the closed office door. And in every script, you will see how he always, one way or another, addresses the sins of humanism. The sins. And he named them. Selfishness. Coldness. Indifference terror, violence. I was not an islander like him, so after some years I moved on, but our work together continued. One thing he wrote, I want to quote. In The Hour of the Wolf, the film, a character says, the glass, is shattered, but what do the splinters reflect? And I feel that this is a good question that Ingmar gives the world today. The fair during the Second World War, he wrote about that in his way. And then the Cold War, which suffused many of his films and now, we live in this kind of a world again with the terrorism and the homeless spread everywhere on our earth. The last movie he made was Sarah Bond. And when it was over, when he had done the last shot, it was about a woman who visits her husband after many years, after they had parted. And the husband says, why did you come here? And she says, well, you called upon me. 
And when the last scene was shot, we were going to have a dinner and we were going to congratulate him and we were going to talk about his next film. But suddenly he stood in the door before the dinner. He stood in the door of the studio and he said, harder. And that means goodbye in Swedish. He left Stockholm that night in a private plane. He went to Fora, to his island, and for nine years he lived there, never to return, never to make another movie. I visited him at some times, but one day I felt something is happening with him. And I rented a private plane. And I went to Fora. And he was already on his way. And I went into his bedroom, and it was late afternoon. And I sat and held his hand, and I, I don't know that he knew I was there. But I talked to him. And he had a picture of Arlon Josephson, one of his favorite actors, just above the bed. And suddenly I said, and I remember the last film he did and we did together, Sarah Bond, when the husband asks, why did you come? And I said the same to Ingmar that late afternoon. You know, Ingmar, I came because you called upon me. And I didn't mean me. You called upon everyone who loved your movies, who saw you writing, those who felt that their life changed a little by what he did. We need a filmmaker like Ingmar today. We need him more than ever to show us who we are and why we are. Maybe to remind us, like his night in the seventh seal, remind us that to find redemption in one meaningful way. That's why we are here because of the other. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. This is beautiful. Thank you. And one of your other many talents, obviously, is on display. You're an exquisite writer that was beautifully composed. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so. We have a chance now to talk a little bit about you as an artist also. Um, obviously, you intersect with Ingmar Bergman. Much of your artistic development was in concert with him. But I want to ask at the beginning, your artistic impulse to become an actress. You had a very different kind of childhood. You were born in Tokyo. You lived in Canada, in the US. Um, you had a very literate, literate mother. Um, you had a desire to be a creative individual. How did you start in acting in the stage in Norway when you were a teenager? Well, I was very shy and I didn't speak very much. I didn't really speak before I was getting close to my 30s, unless I was <laughs> <laughs> spoken to. But I knew that when my mother had family parties or her friends were there, you know, if I made a little theater performance, like, you know, the little girl with the mattress that Hans Christian Andersen wrote, and it was always very sad. That's why Ingmar liked me, I think. You know, <laughs> and she was hungry, and, and it was Christmas Eve, and she had no home, and she longed for her grandmother who was gone. And then she does these matches, 
and there from heaven comes the grandmother and takes her home. And I would do that for the grown-ups. And of course they listened to me and they watched me and they cried. And I thought, this is a profession for me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as it turned out, it was. And yeah. that's probably why I never got to do a, a, a comedy because uh, and I am, a, I could be a comedy person, and it's too late, but they always see that little match girl in me, for some reason. So, after this, in, this moment of um, starting to work in the theater, you started to work in Norwegian films, and um, you met B.B. Anderson, and that led to the next phase of your life. If you would tell that story, I think it's, it's really, kind of a magical moment. Yes, well, Bibi Anderson, you know, was very much working in many of Ingmar Bergman's films. And Bibi and I did a movie up in the north of Norway, and it, we, there was no hotel there or anything, so we, we lived in a, in a school, and Bibi and I shared a classroom. And at night, and we were both, you know, like, uh, 21 years old and we talked about the future and both of us were newly married and what we wanted to do with our our life and he, she told me about Ingmar Bergman and I thought oh she knows Ingmar Bergman oh incredible and we became the best of friends and uh, I went to Sweden and visited her and she came to Norway and one day when I visited her we were walking on the street and there comes Ingmar Bergman <laughs> and, and he stops and he talks, and he said, I know you. And he said, would you like to be in one of my movies? <laughs> and I thought, this is like, you know, Lana Turner, who, who was found in a, in a grocery shop, I think, in Hollywood. In Schwab's drugstore. In yes. Schwab's restaurant. And, and I said, yes, what could I say? And he said, well, you will get the script tomorrow. And actually, <laughs> it, it was true. I went to Norway, got the script. It was a very little part, and Bibi had the, the lead of the movie. And then he suddenly got sick, and he always got sick when there was something he didn't want to do. So, <laughs> so he went into a hospital, and it was over for me, I thought. And Bibi was very sad, and so we went on a long journey, Bibi and I, to Poland and to Czechoslovakia. And when we came to Czechoslovakia, the embassy got hold of us and said, you have to go back to Stockholm. Ingmar is now well again, and he has written a script in 14 days, and it's going to be called Persona, and it's written for the two of you. And Ingmar claimed, I don't know if it's true, that while he was lying, you know, very sick there in Stockholm, he saw two pictures of Bibi and me, and he saw our likeness. And he said that inspired him, and he wrote the script to Persona. And Bibi and I took the airplane to Stockholm, and uh, a week after, we started shooting. And because I was so shy, and it's really true, I didn't speak too much when I wasn't spoken to. My part was uh, she didn't speak. I have one word, and that is nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew one thing, although we never discussed it, but I knew one thing. She, me, is Ingmar, the person, and I should have been older, I was only 25, the person who has been in a job for so long and gone around and listened and talked, suddenly decides never to talk again, uh, wanting to turn his back to the world, and I knew that my person was uh, Ingmar, and so, after Persona, when I started to do many films with Ingmar, I did not take any part away from women. I took parts away from men because he used me very often to speak for him. That's my theory, and I never discussed it with Ingmar, but it happens to be true. <laughs> <laughs> and Persona made such an impact internationally, and I think it's the mountain of film criticism. It's the most challenging movie to analyze, but when you were making it, you didn't anticipate that it would be so profound or received in that way. No, it seemed so simple somehow, and many things he improvised. You know, there's a scene where our two faces 
float together, and that happened by accident when he was editing the movie, by suddenly these two faces came together. He thought, that's fantastic, and that is part of the movie. Or Bibi and I were sitting outside and eating our lunch, and we had hats on and comparing hands. That came into the movie, and a lot of it was improvised, though not the lines, but a lot of scenes, images you see, were improvised. And we said, or I didn't say it then, but those who knew better said, this will never be a movie, you know. It's so simple. And, and it was such a fun movie and a wonderful movie. And then it turned out to be this uh, sensation. And it, of course, it changed my life because uh, at the end of the movie, we we've fell in love. and. Uh, we moved together to this uh, island. Yeah, and I want to ask you more about the photo. I've been lucky to be there at the Bergman Week, which is an annual um, group of critics and, and academics, and they come and watch the films and go to all the locations. Um, and it's a magical place, but Persona was your first experience of going there. And then you became part of this family, this troupe of actors and craftspeople. So tell us a little about becoming part of that world. It was such a complete world. It was a complete world, but you know, people think that actors can be so jealous and so of each other. And, and I have never experienced that because I came new and I came from another country. I was the first one from another country in Ingmar's films. I never felt from anyone, not from Bibi, my best friend, or anyone in his troupe. I felt tremendously, tremendously welcome. And just a story about Bibi, because the second movie I did with Ingmar, and that was after we were living together, uh, I, we were in Italy, Ingmar and I, and we were in Stockholm when the premiere started, but Bibi came to Rome for some other reason, and she had a beautiful uh, bag for parties, and she gave it to me, and she said, congratulations, you are such a success. And I will never forget it, because she could easily have thought, you know, I could have done that, and she could have done that. Uh, and, and that's the kind of welcoming that group of people gave. But that also has to do with the happiness that we all shared in all his productions. It's the happiest set ever. And if you think they are gloomy, you are wrong. They are fun. I mean, they are really fun. And nobody loves to make jokes and things like Ingmar, and very childish jokes. I know when I did Faithless, which you're showing later tonight, I know he was absolutely forbidden to come to the set and forbidden to do anything. But the last day he was to come to the set and, and uh, I was to tell no one, but everybody knew he was coming to the set. And he came in the lunch hour and it was to be filmed in a hotel room with a bed. And uh, Lena Endre, who played the lead, she was to come and lie down in this bed and be very dramatic and sad and so. And Ingmar's idea was, when we were alone in the studio before anyone came, he said, I will be under the blanket. And so when she comes and does this, she will find me. <laughs> it was such a stupid joke, but he loved it. And so he went under the blanket and everybody came in and Lena came in and she saw the blanket going up and down and, up and, down. and she knew, but it was his joke and we loved it because uh, that is Ingmar. He wasn't gloomy. He was lovely, actually. <laughs> yeah. And, and part of this family, it wasn't just the actors. It was all the technical crew and people like the legendary Sven Nykvist who you know, shot so many of your films. And so tell me a little bit about working with Sven. Sven Nyquist, uh, you know, every cinematographer while Sven Nyquist lived, however famous they were, and you would ask them, who do you think is the best cinematographer in the world? And most of them would say Sven Nyquist. And he was such a shy, beautiful uh, man. And, you know, uh, and behind his camera, uh, he would never give you compliments or anything, but sometimes he would say, you know, 
I, I didn't really see what you did because my eyes were full of tears and he would say such uh, really inspiring things. And Ingmar and he had such a quiet language. They knew each other and they used very little light and mostly they agreed, but I remember once they did not agree because Sven really wanted more of a light on whoever he was filming. And Ingmar said, no, that light should not be there. And in the end, Sven won because he was the cinematographer. So the light was on the person. Next day, they are watching the rushes of what they did before. Ingmar was right. That light was terrible. Ingmar was so furious because, yeah, he was loving and funny, but he also got very furious. And he was furious at Sven and let everybody know who was watching how terrible the advice of Sven was. And Sven just sat quiet and took it all and took it all and took it all. And then <laughs> the story was that people had gone into the studio late in the evening and there was that light that Sven had insisted on. And Sven Nyquist was standing in front of the light saying, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, that's a true story. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> So this is, a lot of this work is happening in the summertime in Foro because in the winter, Ingmar would go to Stockholm and work in the theater yes. and write his screenplays. And then in the summer was the filming season. Um, and one of the magical things that's happened with Foro is that now there's the Bergman Center, um, which your daughter Lynn has really taken the lead in creating. And so um, I guess I want to ask you a little about how that came together and her role in preserving the legacy and, um, and making it a living artistic center. Well, she really did that, and I, I think all the credit goes to her. Uh, many people wanted to buy his main house, and he owned other houses there, and one of the houses he made into a beautiful cinema, and so, and people wanted to buy it to have bread and breakfast in these houses, or have, rich people wanted to have it as a rich uh, number two Bergman or something, I don't know. Lynn said this should be an artistic place and people should come here and they should be invited and they shouldn't pay anything. The only thing they have to promise is to leave something of their artistry, whether they were poets or writers or actors or directors or whatever. And it was very difficult to find somebody who would put all that money into it just because he believed in it. And she found the man, and of course he was Norwegian, and, and he did it for a lot of money. He put his money into it, and it still exists. It was Lynn's idea, and for several years, she really made sure that it was this artistic center, and it still is uh, there. And I know when I was doing Long Death Journey Tonight as an actor, uh, we were the first uh, actor group that came and rehearsed in, in my old home <laughs> and went to the cinema, and life was so... Uh, different because Ingmar wasn't there anymore, but at the same time he was there. And my colleague said, where did he sit in the cinema? And of course then the director of our play sat down and I thought, oh, how tactless he is. <laughs> and, and it was incredible. And I have to say that was Lynn's uh, creation. It's, it's exceptional. It's so beautiful there. Yeah. Um, and, and now here we are in Germany, and you've filmed here, and you filmed in this building. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, working here in 1989 on the Rose Garden, um, which is based on a true story. Um, and Maximilian Schell and Peter Fonda were the actors. Franz Rademacher was the director. Do you, and Art, Archer Browner, actually, whose centennial it is this year, was the producer. Um, do you remember much about filming here? A lot takes place at the airport. This building um, was used as a location. Well, I thought when I came here again, because I haven't been here since, that it would come back to me. But in certain ways, it didn't, because everything you showed me when we went around made, you know, more of a, uh, an impression on me. 
But I have incredible memories of, of this movie because Fons, the director, mm -hmm. he's been dead many years now. He was the kind of director that Ingmar was, and he was real, he was cultural, he was, uh, he was incredible. And Max von Sydow and I made several movies together, and Peter Fonda and I made movies together, and, and we were very happy. We filmed in the day, and in the evenings we, we went to restaurants, and it's so strange. I have not been in Frankfurt since then. I've been on Frankfurt Airport, because whenever you travel uh, to Europe, and I do that often, I always go via Frankfurt Airport with my favorite <laughs> airplane. And then, uh, but I have not been over the borders before this time. So it's very strange, and I know the old city is now being made new again. And I know also the theme of this movie. I, I would like to see it again, and, and I, I would really recommend it, because it was about an important time in all our lives, and from the Second World War, and about children being abused, and a court case. And we live in a time when children are abused, and there should be a court case. Absolutely. Thank you. Now, um, some of your other connections to Germany come through a difficult chapter in Ingmar Bergman's life because he was a tax exile and left Sweden and he came to Berlin uh, and worked in the theater. And were you very much involved in that phase of his, his creative life? Uh, I wasn't involved in the theater. Uh, play and all of us missed him making movies in, in Sweden because he didn't come to Sweden. And I saw Margareta von Trotta's movie about Ingmar and I saw that same kind of love that he was showing his German troupe, that he was showing all of us. And it's like he adapted to the new circumstances which then was uh, Germany, and we missed him, and I just think he and the German actors and the German crew that he worked with uh, gave him a gift, and he gave them a gift, because the love expressed from the actors were, were really great. But then he made an international movie here, and then I was asked to come, and that was... Um, the Serpent's Egg. The Serpent's Egg, and I loved it, because I was kind of almost different, you know. I was sad most of the time. But, <laughs> but then uh, I was also a cabaret dancer and a cabaret singer like Marlene Didrich. And I had a fantastic composer who had made this song for me. And, and I rehearsed with him day after day, and I thought, oh, wait till Ingmar sees me, you know. I, I, I thought I was like Marlene Didrich, and you will never know. <laughs> and, and then came the day when we were going to film this, and I looked so forward to that Ingmar would see this new side of my talent, you know, with these stockings and uh, this voice and everything. And, then he wasn't too nice because <laughs> I, I got through like two lines and he said, enough, that's enough. And he didn't redo it. Well, those two lines are there, but that is you all. You didn't get to do the song? No. And I will never forgive him. I, I really, I, <laughs> I think if I had done that, the movie would have had more of a fling. And so, and I don't know how good reviews it got, but... Maybe because of everything that has happened, I don't know. And uh, Caridan, uh, Caridan uh, oh, I forgot the name. Uh, he played the lead and... Oh, Keith Carradine. Not Keith, but his brother. David. 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 And he had a kind of sleeping illness, so when Ingmar was giving instructions, he sometimes, you know, would <laughs> fall asleep. So, it, yeah, in certain ways, it, it was uh, very different. But I remember a few years before Ingmar died, he and I, I was in Fora visiting him, and we sat and we looked at uh, the serpent's egg, 
And when it was over, England, this is a good movie. And I say the same. I think it is a really good movie. I mean, even without me singing. And I think he had to pay a price for having left Sweden. And I, I, I really think so. And I wish somebody would show that movie again because I think it had, I thought it was good when I saw it. And Ingmar was delighted. He was very delighted. <laughs> And during that phase, it was a very difficult, challenging time for him, but two, two other things came out of that moment that I wanted to mention. One is that he won the Goethe Prize, which was awarded here in Frankfurt, um, but also it gave him the impetus to write the screenplay for Autumn Sonata, which we screened just now, earlier tonight. It was the movie you selected to be screened tonight. and. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, the development of that story and then how it all came together with Ingrid Bergman making her return to the Swedish performing. Uh, well, that yeah. was really great, you know, and I think they met either in Cannes or in Germany, mm -hmm. and he asked her and she said yes, and it was a sensation. Ingmar Bergman and Ingrid Bergman are going to make this movie together, but that was two stars. You know when you work with Ingmar, there's one stars and then it's the rest of us. This time there were two stars, not because Ingrid Bergman acted like a star, but you know the, uh, the whole thing that she was going to be in his movie was really great and uh, in the press conference, you know, they asked her more questions than, than him. And then on the reading, and now I say it, I didn't say it before you saw the movie, when we were doing the reading, Ingmar never changed the words of anything. What he had written, that's gold. And we always knew that, so we never questioned that. But since this was a movie about a pianist, very famous and traveling around the world, and then neglecting, in terms of the script, uh, the daughter, both Ingrid and I said in beforehand, you know, isn't that a little unfair? I mean, she's saying yes to her calling and she's still the mother and so, no, that's how it is. And uh, well, can you, Ingrid specifically said, can you change a little because I don't believe uh, the mother would say this? And he said, no, not at all. And then we said, well, can we act, uh, act against the words? And he said, yes, you are actors, you act against the words. So I, I was 40 years old and still telling my mother that my life was so miserable because of her. Actually, no, I recognize it. <laughs> and, 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 and she had to live with it. But I, 40 years old, I had pigtails and, you know, little glasses. So, you know, poor me, not because I had glasses, but the way I was wearing them. And, and she was beautiful and and then when we did the reading, every other sentence she said, she said, I can't say that. This is not good uh, writing. And so, and he was so hurt. He could take discussion about directing, but he could not be criticized for his writing. And I understand that because that goes to your soul. That's where it came from. And when the reading was <coughs> over, uh, he asked everybody to leave and he cried. He said, I don't think I can do this. But he did it. And the one episode I should tell from that was you who saw the movie know the daughter tells the mother suddenly how neglected she was, how terrible it was, and goes on and on. It's three pages in the script, and they took everything on me first with the camera, and then they turned the camera towards Ingrid, and Ingrid said, she was saying something, please forgive me and hold around me. I think she says more, but that's what she said. I'm not going to say that. I want to slap her in the face and I want to leave the room. <laughs> and it was terrible. And they started screaming to each other. And then they left the room and we heard them in the corridor. We thought, no, the movie is over, for sure. And then they came in, the genius, of course, Ingmar, one, and the actress. But she did something fantastic. She say these words, you know, forgive me and all of that, but look at her eyes. 
They are so full of anger, and it looks like all the women in the world who have to say again, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I did something wrong again, uh, and don't mean it, because they are angry and upset. And she won an Oscar for it. <laughs> and, and the strange thing is, I saw much of this movie in San Francisco. I was going to do an event like this, and I saw not all of it, but I saw a lot of my anger that day. And I always believed what I was doing. I believed it. I, I, I really cared for that part. But while I was watching it, I was thinking, is she lying? Maybe it's not all true. Maybe it's not all true. And still to this day, I don't know if I as an actress think I'm telling the truth and I'm lying or if I was telling the truth, and suddenly because of life and no, I've been a mother, I think, ah, oh, the daughter is uh, lying. That was very interesting. I want to write about that. Well, and the other film that you selected to show today is a film you directed, Faithless, Trolosa, and um, that was not the first film you directed, but it was the first Ingmar Bergman script that you directed, right? No, or I made the private confessions before, before this. that, okay. which was about his family, yeah. So when you um, approached Faithless, um, he, he wrote it and then he gave it to you, and then how did you separate from him to be able to bring your own uh, marked on the, on the work? Well, I had to separate with him because he's controlling and he had written a script. And when I did private confessions first, you know, he never came to the studio, but he came uh, when I was editing and had suggestions. And I didn't always agree with him. And I even went to that thing that I cried to get my will. And he fell for that because men do that. <laughs> But I didn't want to go through that again with, uh, with this movie. Uh, and so he was forbidden to come to the set. And then he was forbidden to come to the editing room. And the only thing I asked him before I did the movie, I said, because this is about you. This is a story about you. No, it's not. And I said, but why are you calling me Bergman? if it's not about you. Well, I couldn't think of another name. So, you know, that was first. And then there's a young man there, and that young man is clearly him as a young person. And, and, and he's telling a story about unfaithfulness, and it's not our story, it's a story that happened in his life that I knew about. And I said, don't you think that Bergman when he's listening to, when he was young and he was unfaithful, that he's now willing, as the writer, to forgive himself? No, there's no forgiveness for what that Bergman, him, or in the film did, no forgiveness. And so I wasn't allowed to change that. But what I did is that the young man, when he has his, uh, in front of the mirror, he's saying to himself, I was unfaithful, it was terrible, I shouldn't have done it, and gave all the reasons for why he didn't do it, and he kind of cries. And that was the scene. Now, what I did, I brought him into the room where the older Bergman is sitting, who is writing the story, and I brought him into the room, and he tells the story to the older person. And the older person hears the whole story, and then, he reaches out and takes his hand and does this without a word, but forgives him. Ingmar never said if that was okay or not, but it was fine. But what he did say was when Bergman is sitting writing at his table, and then I had him get up. I didn't change the words, but I had him get up from his table and look out of the window, and this old man is about to die, and there on the beach, he sees himself. I thought that was incredible. You know, what a good thought. And I show it to Ingmar when the movie was ready, and it, that goes out. That absolutely goes out, and it was going to come. But Ingmar, it's, it's so important, it's, it goes out. 
And it went out for con, but it came in again because he changed his mind and said, okay, you can keep it. And this is a thing that I will never know because he made a documentary about himself. And I don't know if this was done before my movie or after the movie, because if you see the documentary that Ingmar produced and made of himself, He's sitting at the table writing, like Bergman in Faithless. And then he gets up and he goes to the window, Ingmar Bergman himself, and looks out and there on the beach, there walks Ingmar Bergman. <laughs> you know, maybe once I had a better idea <laughs> than, than him. <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> So we are going to open it up for questions in just a minute, but before we do, I wanted to ask you what you think Ingmar Bergman would make of all the attention around his centennial and the legacy that is coming to the fore. There's an exhibition about him called Truth and Lies opening in Stockholm this week. Um, many of his plays are being represented. Um, many of his um, scripts are being presented as stage plays or operas. Um, people are really rediscovering him also as a writer, not just as a director of these films. So how, how do you look at his, his reassessment during this year? I, I think he would be happy, really honestly, because what he always wanted to be was to be recognized as a writer, and they didn't really do that. And all the people who are doing plays of his movies and so, they have recognized his writing. And as you say, they put it in operas and TV, on stages and everywhere, and they found a new richness that they didn't know. Also because his movies are so symbolic, so incredibly, uh, that you don't always hear what they are saying. But no, you recognize the, the writer. Uh, he would have been so happy. And he, he, he deserves it because he says things that may be more actual today than they were when they were written. And do you miss him? Do you miss having him in your life as a, as a living entity? Yeah, I miss phoning him and saying, what do you think? Or this is troubling me or... What do you think about Trump? I would like to. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I, mi I miss him. Mm -hmm. And uh, I miss him for my daughter. It would be a great father to have now with her books coming out. Mm -hmm. And he read her first two books, but it would be great for her too. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, it's so beautiful. So, um, so we want to give you all a chance just to ask a few questions. We don't have a lot of time, unfortunately, because we are showing Faithless shortly, but we have some microphones in the aisles, and if you want to just raise your hand, we can take a few questions. Everyone's overcome with emotion, yes. Um, so you said you often saw him in the parts that you played yourself. Do you think that that made it more difficult for you to step into that part and kind of adopt it in your own character? Can, can you say? Yeah, you, in many of the roles you saw him, you saw Ingmar in the roles you were given to play. Did that make it more difficult for you to take that role or embody that character? No. It's only my hearing, and the microphone wasn't you. So, uh, no, I, I, I don't feel that because uh, I admired what I saw and recognized him. And he did a movie where I really felt I could use myself, and it was about a woman like me, a lot of women like me, and that was scenes from a marriage. Uh, there I really felt uh, I wasn't the him, I was, uh, I was me. But that's an interesting question. I never heard that before. <laughs> okay, anyone else? Yes, on the back side over there. 
Are we going to see you in a movie again? And when? <laughs> I'm never going to direct again a movie or a theater. I'm never going to be on stage again as an actress. But if somebody suddenly sees something, even a comedy, yes, I would. <laughs> I, I would do that. Yes, next question, please. When, when shooting these serious scenes that we've seen, when people are crying, you know, shouting at each other and so on, so what's the atmosphere on the set like? Is somebody joking five minutes before and after, or is there just silence for two hours? <laughs> I'll tell you a story. You were asking crying on, on the set? Or what, what yes. was the balance between a serious scene and people enjoying the experience and laughing? when the take was not happening? Oh, that's the best because uh, if you are completely relaxed and you feel you are with friends, uh, you are also so open to everything else. And in Faithless, uh, very shortly I will say, Lena Endra, she has a long scene where she is going to tell her, her daughter, I'm leaving you for 14 days, I'm going to move in with another man, and then we will see each other again. And she is retelling that story. And Lena Endre told the story. I told my daughter I was going to leave her. I found a man, I'm moving out of the house. And then you see the two of them together, and you see the little girl uh, leave the mother, and you see her walk out of the bedroom and she's so little, she's seven years old and she's so thin and has just a little blouse on and thin. And, and, and when she did this, it was masterful. Lena Endre is an incredible theater actress as well as, as movie actress. Uh, and the crew applauded. But I knew it can even be more when it really comes from Lena's heart and being safe where she is now. And I said to her, Lena, when you tell this story, you must know that the rest of your life, you will always see that thin little back walk out of your room and around the corner and never turn. That's going to be part of your life. And she, of course, understood it. And she did it one more time. And please see Faithless and you will see it's not even acting, it's uh, living acting. It's the best thing I've almost ever seen an actress do. And nobody applauded. <laughs> it was quiet. <laughs> yeah. Let's see, is there one more question? No, okay, right there, please. I just have a question. I just saw the movie Downstairs, and I, I have seen it when it came out in 78, but I understood it today much better because I'm older and I have other experiences. When you do things like this, where you are very excited, where you shout at your mother, how uh, later on when the scene is over, everything is, is closed up, how... Uh, do you get down for yourself? How do you calm down? I mean, it must be very exciting. And how can you uh, let loose after such a scene and have your normal life again? Or is it just a question of skill? You know, there are different kinds of actors. Some are really character actors, and you know, they are different from film to film. And some are actors, uh, Stanislavski actors and they are the part for the whole day or the week or whatever. I'm not that kind of actor. I have to be honest. When I've done a scene and I feel it's gone good, the moment he says, Scott, I'm red in my cheeks and I feel good. I did it. I made it <laughs> in my life. Uh, I'm leave again and I again did what I know to do best, which is acting. Uh, so, no, it has no 
effect on me at all. And there are many actors like that, but we are all different. But it's wonderful if you feel, if you're making a dress and the dress turns out nicely, it's, it's incredible. You manage to do your craft. It's like the ballet dancer that my grandmother talked about, you know. The moment the ballet dancer lands on the floor again and knows I've been up there two, three seconds, then it's human possible. You feel good because you are part of the miracle of doing your craft. So, I want to thank you, Liv Ullman, for being here with us tonight, for being so generous with your time. She's even more generous in that she's agreed uh, to sign some DVDs and some books. So we have some Bergman box sets, um, Ingmar Bergman's um, incredible autobiography, uh, Laterna Magica, uh, the Taschen book about Bergman, but another book that's quite special. It is uh, a book selected by Ms. Ullman for us to present to you. And I think I'm just going to ask her to say a little bit about why this book is meaningful and why, it, if you want to join the Leave Ullman Book Club, she is recommending this strongly to us. And the book happens to be German, and her name is Jenny Arpenbeck. And in English, I read it in English, it's uh, go, went, gone. Gehen, ging, gegangen. Please read it. It's about growing older. The main character is a man. He has just retired. What do I do with my life? Oh, it's time for tea again, and time for going to bed again, and time for this, and time for that. And suddenly he starts to see the world around him. And he lives in Berlin, and he starts to see a group of people from African countries. He didn't even know there were 54 African countries in the world. And he doesn't only feel empathy, because in the beginning he does that, and he finds out where they live for a short time before they are maybe sent out of the country. Uh, he also feels compassion. And the book is ending with six or seven or eight of them are living in his home. And one is learning to play piano, and it's different. It's, it's an incredible book, and it's really about all of us to think about the, the time we are living. And I think most of us are not opening our, our homes necessarily, but there is something that she is saying. There's something we can do every day to have a moral way of living. We cannot accept what is done to homeless people all over the world. Uh, I, I saw a picture when the Syrian refugee was enormous, and the, everybody has seen that picture. It was a little boy and very bloody in his face and everything, and he was sitting on the back of a big truck on a kind of sofa. And, and he does this, and he sees the blood on his hands, and he doesn't understand. And then he puts his hand down on the sofa. And then he remembers what he has learned at home. Oh, you don't dirt your sofa. And he puts his hand here. You see a, a boy who has learned how to live, what to do, and he's six years old. And I doubt that he is alive even today because he was very hurt. Uh, I know the first child I ever met in Thailand in, in a refugee camp in the middle of 1970. He only said this, sometimes I cry, but only when it rains, so the other children will not see it. We can tell these stories, we watch TV, they are not going to be a group. This book is also telling us they are not groups, they are individuals. You're asked to go from your country, and you left your country, and suddenly you are gone. You are no one. Uh, it's 
up to us not only to feel empathy, but in one way or another feel compassion every day by giving money or recognizing them or smiling or doing simple things. But there are no other people in our world. We are living here together, all of us. And that's what this book is about. And I thought she must have been my age to, to, to write about an uh, old man. But she's 30 years younger. She's a young woman. And it's uh, you young people. It's stimulating reading to know we had the Second World War, we had the Cold War, and now it's worse than ever. And our leaders are using a language. We mustn't adopt to it. We mustn't get used to it. And we must... We must, we must do we something. Must. Absolutely. Thank you, Liv Ullman, everyone. A legend here in our house. Thank you for being with us.